Good morning. Thank you for coming to uh, OpenStack. Thank you for coming to this talk. Um, I would have been here a little bit earlier, but they wouldn't let me down the stairs, and I didn't realize another entrance. So it's not an inauspicious start. But hopefully, things will go smooth sailing from now on. Um, it's kind of good to be back in Berlin. Uh, I was here about a year ago. I went to the uh, Technology Museum, saw the uh, um, Frederick um, Konrad Zeus's uh, Z1, one of the, I could be one of the first programmable computers. Uh, kind of really great to see such kind of old technology. It still works. Um, sadly, didn't really run Kubernetes, uh, didn't really run a, a good Java virtual machine. So uh, can't really talk about that much more. But we can talk about um, deploying distributed databases and in-memory computing with uh, Kubernetes. So let's get started. So very quickly, what we're going to talk about is uh, deploying distributed databases uh, on Kubernetes. Um, we're going to talk about the different ways we can do that. Uh, we're going to talk about um, deploying in memory-only deployments and with state. Um, and very quickly, we're going to talk about management and monitoring the tools. And finally, we're going to do a very quick demo. Um, it's quite difficult to do a demo with just a laptop. I didn't want to rely on the conference networking. Um, but hopefully, we can get something to kind of show you that it kind of works and how it goes. So we're at an infrastructure conference. So I assume you guys know what Kubernetes is. Um, very simply, an open source system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. What you might know, not know quite so well, is what an uh, in-memory distributed database is. And while there are a number of different, different uh, products available that do it, the one I'm going to talk about here is uh, Apache Ignite. Um, so Apache Ignite, we define as a memory-centric distributed database caching and processing platform for transactional, analytical, and streaming workloads delivering in-memory speeds at petabyte, petabyte scale. Um, and this presents a number of, I wouldn't say difficulties, but differences with how we normally deploy applications in Kubernetes. Kubernetes, typically you scale things out and the nodes, the pods sort of don't interact in many ways. You kind of scale them out and each node is different sorry, is identical, and you can add and remove them to scale things without uh, too many consequences. Um, Apache Ignite and other in-memory databases are slightly different. So we're going to take a, take a, bit, a step back and kind of talk about how they differ from traditional databases um, and what they look like. I, I say I'm going to talk about Apache Ignite. Others are available. They look broadly similar, although there could be some differences. So Ignite, in-memory centric storage. So the, the way I tend to start when I talk about this slide is right in the middle, the red bit, the memory centric storage. And although this is like one pretty picture, you can think about this spread across potentially thousands of nodes and terabytes of data. And this is like at the center of the system. And Ignite is uh, memory first, which means that in general, Everything's in memory. You can process it. You can store it. You can access it really, really quickly. And if we kind of go down on the slide, you can see the other aspects. So being in memory is great. It's fast. You can access it very quickly. But what happens when the memory goes, when it's, the node goes down, when it, um, you need to restart for some reason? You potentially lose your data. So we've got two different ways of kind of keeping that data. Firstly, we have Ignite native persistence. We also have third-party persistence, so you can kind of save your data into an Oracle or a Sybase or a Postgres or a MySQL database. And the other advantage of having this uh, external disk-based storage is, of course, it's slower, but disk space is much cheaper than memory. So you can do things like uh, storing historical data on disk and just the stuff you want to process really quickly, keep it in memory. And you can still access it using exactly the same APIs. It just, uh, it just works a little bit more slowly. So it's kind of that hybrid. And as we'll see in a minute, th this fact that we have, we store stuff down to disk as an extra complication 
uh, in, when we're trying to deal with things in Kubernetes as well. Nothing we can't pr solve, um, but it does add like an extra wrinkle. And then we kind of go up um, and onto like the more kind of uh, client side applications sort of thing, but kind of building on the memory centric infrastructure. So the simple one is a key value store. We have a, value, a key and a value, it goes to the grid, comes back to the client. Uh, very straightforward, very much like many other key value store databases. Um, and much like them, it's kind of spread out across the grid. You don't need to know which node the data's on. It's kind of nice and simple. Um, one thing we have is uh, SQL. So you can access all the data in the grid using SQL. And that's, again, distributed across the entire thing. You can do joins across nodes if you want, although that's much slower than doing it on one machine. And it, again, it kind of works from the client side and you can do your application. We do transactions. Compute is an important one. Uh, we, rather than, in most databases, you take the data you, on your client application, you go to the server, get the data you want, bring it to the client, do the processing, send it back, the results back to the server. Um, in Ignite, um, you tend to send the compute to the data rather than the other way around. So it works much more quickly because the data is already there, it doesn't need to be transferred across the network, and all that stuff. Um, we have, also have services. Um, so again, you can define your own APIs, kind of um, how you want to put it. So like uh, microservices within the grid. Um, streaming data, a lot of the fast moving data, the stuff that you want to kind of deal with uh, in memory is sort of real time or near real time, and Ignite can deal with that. And machine learning, because we have all the data in memory, we can access it really fast. We have lots of compute because we're on a grid with huge numbers of CPUs. We can do machine learning really quite, quite quickly and kind of do it in near real time as well. And obviously, this is a horizontal application. Um, there's many, many use cases, and we, we have many clients in different areas. So financial services is an obvious one because uh, low latency requirements, high volumes of data. But there's many other use cases, uh, telco, travel, logistics, e-commerce, anything that has internet scale. I'm not sure I like that term, but internet scale, kind of huge numbers of records, petabytes of data, doing things in a grid. So in terms of Kubernetes, we have a few challenges. Um, first thing is we have lots of nodes. Kubernetes can handle that. That's totally not a problem. It knows about pods. It knows about how to distribute things uh, around uh, the actual physical machines. That's kind of great. But when you deal with something like MySQL or Oracle, you tend to have um, a bunch, uh, like a, a, a data, you have a, a volume, and you have one or more kind of compute nodes, kind of pods um, that talk to the data. Um, and when you scale out, you tend to just add more nodes. The nodes don't need to talk to each other because they just talk basically directly to the, to the disk and everyone's happy. That's not how we need to work in a kind of distributed world. In a distributed world, the nodes are kind of independent, but they also need to know which, where each other are. Because when I, as a client, go in, I connect to this bottom node, and I kind of say, I would like this, uh, the, the value related to this key, that data might not be on that node. It might be over there or one of the other machines. And we need to go to find out where that data is and, and go straight to the, get the data so we can kind of pull it back and do the compute. Or the other way around, when we're doing a computation, we want to be able to send the computation to the right node. And all the nodes need to know what the other nodes are doing um, in order to kind of link them together and figure out what's going on. So the first kind of complication is the nodes need to talk to each other. Um, unlike Traditional databases, again, we don't have one big bucket of storage that is accessed by all the nodes. Um, you could do that, but you'd lose one of the big advantages, which is kind of scaling out. So if you've got one big uh, chunk of data, that's your single point of failure. That is your uh, area that's not going to scale to the same degree as the number of nodes. If I add another node, I get another disk. And that helps me scale out much more quickly and much more seamlessly. So each node has a persistent 
store as well. And we need, every time we add a node, we need to add some more storage as well, especially when we're dealing with um, uh, the persistent store, as we mentioned before. Um, and of course, we also want to be able to dynamically add and remove nodes. That's easy, right? We do that with web servers and things all the time. However, not all the nodes, all the nodes are capable of doing the same thing. They're all Ignite nodes, they all kind of store data, they all can do computations. But of course, we don't put the same data on all the nodes. That'd be quite wasteful, if nothing else. Um, so all the nodes are kind of equal in terms of the code they run, but they're not equal in terms of the data they have. And if you just randomly shut off a node, you tend to, you know, in this case, we shut off a node, you might lose a quarter of your data unless you're careful. So we need to be able to kind of decide which nodes we add and remove kind of easily. Um, and Kubernetes has the facilities to do all this, but the way we normally do it for kind of web servers and so forth is not how you do it in this kind of distributed database kind of world. So how do we do it with Kubernetes? So lots of stuff is exactly the same as before, but we need to make some decisions ahead of time before we kind of start writing our YAML or our JSON files. So firstly, the database is a set of pods, as you might imagine. We have uh, the code, we have maybe your application is kind of built on top of that. And we kind of, Kubernetes provides a lot of the information uh, for you. So IPs are assigned dynamically, auto discovery is needed. We're gonna talk about this uh, soon. So how, how is the application deployed? Well, is that within Kubernetes? Is that outside Kubernetes? Again, it's not something that really matters to the distributed database, but obviously matters in how you deploy your cluster. Um, we obviously need to expose a certain number of ports and things like that if it's not going to be within Kubernetes. Uh, we're not really going to deal with that in this talk because the way it deals with that is very much the same as with other applications. And finally, uh, one of the big deals, uh, the things that we need to kind of think about is whether it's going to be stateless or stateful. So um, obviously we, mean, we maintain state in uh, a distributed database, but the way Ignite works is we might not be uh, fully uh, stateless. We have the state, but the, the permanent state might be stored in a database. Remember, a couple of slides back, we talked about the underlying persistent storage, and one of the modes we can work on is with um, a third party, that kind of legacy database, so we, can have, we could run on top of MySQL or Oracle. And the thing about doing that is if we switch off and restart uh, the, uh, the database grid, our database grid, then basically the data comes back and we don't need to worry about it. So it's effectively stateless and we don't need to worry about it quite so much in, uh, when we're building our grid this time. But it's something we need to think about in ahead of time. So all the nodes when we kind of deploy them into the grid, need to be able to find each other. And clients need to be able to find the nodes in the grid too. How do we do that? Well, Kubernetes knows where all the nodes are. It has its own DNS service. It knows where all the nodes, uh, where all the bits of the, com the components are. Um, so it keeps a track of all the Ignite pods. And it also operates as a gateway for remote apps. You can de define a service. It can kind of go in and kind of uh, has all the load balancing and all that kind of stuff, you can find a node within there. But the nodes within the grid also need to be able to find each other. And how do we do that? Well, you kind of need a bit of glue between the two systems. So Ignite needs to be able to talk to Kubernetes and vice versa to kind of, kind of connect the two sides together. So uh, node one can find node two and we can add and remove them on the fly. And luckily, uh, Ignite comes with one of those. So firstly, we start up a service, um, very simple service, just something you've seen before. We have, uh, in this case, we're gonna talk, talk about having a load balancer, so it's available outside. Um, we have a number of ports that we open. Uh, again, pretty standard stuff. Um, so in the case of Ignite, we're gonna have, uh, we have a REST API that you can access. Um, 
SQL, so you can connect your JDBC or ODBC uh, clients to it. And we have thin clients, thick clients. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, these are just examples, the kind of thing you might have. And we have, we, we run the uh, Kuba control create and kind of create the service that way. Um, all kinds of things you're very familiar with. And the way we kind of tell Ignite about Kubernetes and kind of vice versa is uh, using this uh, configuration option. Um, you don't need to take pictures of this. It's all in the documentation. Uh, it's kind of easy to find. Um, we, uh, Ignite uses uh, Spring framework to uh, configure stuff. Um, so a lot of this, if you've ever used Spring, should look pretty familiar. Basically, we're kind of saying we're configuring Ignite. We're using this uh, TCP discovery SPI. Uh, one of the nice things about Ignite, it has huge numbers of SPIs, kind of pluggable uh, it, architecture, so that if any kind of bit you don't, it doesn't work quite the way you, you like, you can plug in your own implementation. Uh, one of the ones we have here is plugging into Kubernetes. So the IP finder, which is how uh, the nodes find each other, we're going to say we're going to use this uh, TCP discovery Kubernetes IP finder. And what we're doing is we need this namespace and ignite. And what that goes to is goes back to the service, and we call that ignite. And the two work together. So each node knows about uh, all the pods in that kind of configuration. And obviously, that way, you can have multiple uh, clusters as well if you need just to have different service names connecting to each other. Um, this is distinct. Uh, from the, the usual way we configure it. So normally Ignite uh, connects to other nodes. Uh, the default out of the box for development purposes is multicast. So it kind of comes up and kind of pings the network, kind of says anyone else around that looks interesting. Um, the other thing uh, we can do is have a list of nodes in the configuration file. We can have JDBC database uh, access to the list, the list, bunch of others. Obviously Kubernetes, because it knows about the nodes, this is simply the way to do it. But of course, all the nodes not only need to know where the other nodes are, but it also needs to know this configuration. So how do you get the configuration to find the other nodes into the node as you start up? And the short answer to that is use a config map. So we take the uh, quite lengthy uh, Ignite configuration file, and we just add it to a config map. Uh, here, I'm just taking it from a file uh, and put that as a config map into Kubernetes. Then every node can kind of access that as in, in their file system. Again, in the demo, I'll kind of show you where this is and what it looks like, but uh, you've probably come across config maps, and this is the simplest way of getting the configuration across the entire cluster. You can use the same configuration file for servers and clients. Uh, so it, you can just have the one. Sometimes uh, people use slightly cut down versions for clients. Um, just a de design decision. Uh, it doesn't really matter hugely. So we got, we got a node. We got a configuration. Uh, next, the next decision we need to make is uh, how we're going to persist things. So we have a number of different modes. We kind of touched on most of these already. So from the top, in memory. So we have a data grid. We're just using the, if you remember the diagram earlier on, we've got the red in the middle. So everything's in memory. You have the, all the APIs, all the machine learning, all that cool stuff feeding in. Um, you can compute, you can do your key value stores, your processing, feed data in and out, all that kind of stuff. And that's it. Switch off your grid, you lose everything. We use this uh, quite often um, because anything in, in real time, often what happens is we feed the data in, do processing, feed it out, and it's persisted to an external store or something like that. It's, it <laughs> sort of seems pointless to have an in memory database and not store it anywhere, but um, just because we're not storing it doesn't mean the data is not stored. So this is often used. And the other use case we see for this is when uh, it's literally just a cache. And the data can be recreated or is not that, in, in, not that important, maybe, maybe not the right phrase, but things like um, uh, web session caching. You know, if you 
in order to kind of lose the fall in memory, the entire cluster needs to go down. So that's pretty rare. So if your cluster goes down and comes back up again, and all your customers have to log in again, it's not great. Not the end of the world. You're not going to lose everything. Um, the data still comes from your database. So that's, uh, a fair use, that's a fairly common use case. The next one uh, we used to see quite a lot in the past, maybe less now as Ignite and in-memory databases in general get become more established. So in-memory in a third-party database. So effectively, we have a third-party database at the bottom, sucks data into uh, Ignite, and people access the data through Ignite. Um, what this allows is you can scale out. You can get much faster performance because most of the data you need is in memory. It's much more effective than hitting the database directly. It takes some of the load off the database, which is kind of useful. Then as you go further down, uh, in memory, full copy on disk. So this is basically the top one, except when you switch off the cluster, the data is still there. And the last one is the one I mentioned earlier on, where you've got terabytes of data on disk, and maybe just today's data in memory. And Ignite transparently just brings in the stuff you need. Um, so yeah, unlimited data scale beyond RAM capacity. Um, RAM's cheaper than it used to be, but it's still kind of pretty expensive. Um, we often see this last one in, like, in machine learning, because sometimes it's useful to do, have the full history to do some computations, but just uh, today's to like, the ongoing work. So when we're dealing with things in memory, maybe the simplest way of doing it is uh, just using a kind of deployment. Um, you might prefer to be explicit about using a replica set, but broadly speaking, uh, doing a deployment kind of works because uh, if you shut down or add a node, it can and deals with things uh, relatively seamlessly. Um, and um, yeah, and that kind of works quite nicely. So again, this is unlike. Uh, MySQL, where everything is uh, kind of singleton. It's, um, let me start again. So, uh, this is in memory ins uh, installation. So you can use a deployment for that because every node is sort of equal. And if you configure your data to be spread across all the nodes, but with a number of uh, replicas, uh, backup nodes, if you shut down one node at a time, um, the data will be rebalanced on the nodes you do have, and you won't lose anything. So it doesn't really matter which node goes down and comes back up again. The problems come later on when we're dealing with a stateful deployment. When we're dealing with a stateful deployment, we want to make sure that we don't lose any data, because this is our real official data store, right? We don't want to uh, shut down a random node ex you know, and expecting we're going to do this other node later on. We need to kind of understand the order things are going. So we don't, when dealing with a persistent store, this model doesn't work. The, the traditional kind of singleton instance where like my traditional database kind of doesn't work. Uh, replica set, which is basically a replica set, doesn't work. Daemon set should be used when you have a single copy of your application, it must be run on all or a subset of nodes. Again, that doesn't really work in this case. Um, what we do have, and it's been out for a, about a year in, uh, in production, I think, is called stateful sets. And stateful sets are nice because they're sort of like replica sets, but they define which nodes get affected when you scale out or back. You can also do things like dynamic uh, volume provisioning, where you, when you create a, new, a node, you can create storage with it. And that's kind of what we would suggest you use when we talk about stateful deployments. So here, we've got a stateful deployment. Um, we can define the node where, where it's mounted, how much data we need. And the stateful set will kind of decide how we scale out. And the nice thing about it, data is persistent to disk, ordered restarts. So when you start up a cluster, it starts off with node zero, then node one, then node two, um, until your full set is complete. Uh, 
And of course, you can have separate volumes. Um, so the way we persist data is very similar to uh, uh, legacy databases. So we have the data and the indexes. We have uh, transaction logs. And you can still do snapshots and backups and all that kind of stuff. And again, we would typically put them in, in different partitions so we can kind of manage them differently because they have different usage patterns. And you, uh, it's better to kind of split them out like that. One of the other differences when we're dealing with um, a cluster that persists data to disk is that it suddenly becomes important that the cluster knows how many nodes are in the cluster. So when you're dealing with in memory, you can assume that all the data you have is all the data you have. Because if it's in memory, you have it. If it's not, you don't. If you, if you have data on disk, and it could be on any of your nodes, if that node is down for some reason, does the data you're requesting exist, but is on the node that's switched off? Or does it not exist at all? So I do select star from a table where value equals 10. Is 10 on the node that's not working? Or does just that value 10 just not exist at all? And without this kind of known set of data, of no, no, this known set of nodes, we can't really answer that question. We can kind of give you a best guess, which is like, sure, it's not there now, but it might be in the future. Uh, it's not the degree of certainty we normally require. So one extra wrinkle we have to deal with when dealing with uh, stateful data in uh, Ignite is we have to activate the grid. And what this does is it creates what we call a baseline topology. And what that means is we started up the grid. We have 10 nodes, however many. And we're kind of saying, this is the number of nodes you should expect to see in the future. So if next time we bring up nine nodes and someone requests some data, we should go back and kind of say, sorry, I don't know the answer to this. And we might not have everything we need. And the way we do that is we connect to the grid. We run this control script and activate the grid. And that kind of says, bum. What you see now is what you should expect to see in the future. And we can also do things like add and remove nodes from that grid, which goes back to the stateful set, where we know which node is going to be added, added and removed when, um, when we scale up and scale down. So I realize we're running slightly over, so I'm going to skip over a couple of slides here. But ma management and monitoring, um, pretty simple. So Kubernetes has a dashboard that you can kind of see what's going on in terms of the cluster at a high level. It's like we got 10 nodes up and running. They're all happy. Uh, obviously, in your uh, configuration script, you can do things uh, like monitor whether the, the server is kind of happy in each pod. And you can kind of do things like check, is the system up and running? Is it happy bunny? That kind of thing. Um, and Kubernetes will display that in the console. Um, Ignite and Gridgain also has uh, a web console that you can plug in. And you can put that into your cluster and monitor the, the, the grid at a slightly lower level. So in this case, you'd be talking about how many compute jobs are running, how much data is in there, how many rows is in this cache. Um, are we running this machine learning job? Are we doing some compute? Are, are the services up and running? So it's a kind of slightly low level. You can run SQL queries in it, that kind of thing. And um, the web console kind of doesn't care where it's running, doesn't care whether it's running on bare metal in a virtual machine or in a Kubernetes uh, cluster. So I'm going to do a very quick demo. I'm going to do it all from the um, console. On the, from the web console, just because it comes out bigger on the screen. It's a bit easy to see. If I can find the mouse pointer. OK. So as you can see, um, just before our session here, I, I brought up uh, a simple 
uh, cluster in uh, using Minikuba because I wanted to run it on my laptop. So uh, don't expect huge amounts of data to be available. Um, it's very simple. So I set up, as we mentioned before, I have my config map. This is just a very simple configuration file for Ignite. Um, so in the, at the top, you've got all the boilerplate, all the XML stuff. Um, in the middle, we have a very basic thing. So like, uh, normally, when Ignite writes its data, it writes it to the Ignite directory. Obviously, you want your, uh, your pods to be as stateless as possible. We want to be able to remove them and bring them back, not trying to change them. So what we're going to do is you create a work directory, Ignite work. And that will put things like our data files as well as our logs in that directory. The next bit here says we're going to enable persistence. So persistence is true. And then at the bottom, we have our Kubernetes discovery thing. So each node can discover each other. Next, we have the service. Uh, in this case, very simple. Um, uh, I, I didn't do the load balancing here because we don't need it for this uh, training session. Uh, it had two, no two nodes in it, which are defined using this stateful set. So if we look. So replicas two, we called it ignite. Um, we're using, we have this ignite config um, config map, and we're kind of mapping it into the file system. We're using the uh, Docker image Apache Ignite Ignite version 260, which is at the, right now is the current one. We have a few ports here, uh, do interesting things in the grid. Um, again, I'm not going to go into the full amount of detail. The config URI, uh, we kind of tell it where the config file is, and then the storage options. So here we have the config, and we have our storage are both going to this Ignite directory at the top level. And the other interesting thing is we have the volume claim templates. This is so when a new node starts up, it can find some new storage in the new, uh, new pod. As you can see, all the nodes, pods are up and running. So everything should be pretty familiar here. So what I'm going to do, I bring up, is that big enough? Can you see that? I'm not sure how I can increase the size. Um, so let's look at the, the logs first. Um, most of the top half you can ignore. Um, the interesting thing is kind of at the bottom here. So firstly, uh, Ignite cluster is not active. Remember, we have to activate the nodes, um, activate the cluster so it knows how many nodes are in the system. Um, but at the bottom, we can see here, topology snapshot, we have two servers. So using the uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, IP finder, the two nodes have found each other. We can't do anything yet because it's not active, but they know they're there and we can do, and we can start doing things. So firstly, I'm going to do There we go. So now the cluster is active. So that means we can do things like there's nothing like doing a live presentation to show how bad your typing is. Um, so we can do things like create table Ignite.
that very simple. We've um, created a table with two backups, which means when we shut down a node, the data is still going to be there regardless, and done a select star from and found all the data. So um, just what you kind of expect, but we're doing it in a grid. And then when we go back to the stateful set, we can do the scale out. We can add a new node. It's just starting up. There we go. A new node, is, as, as you can see, got zero, one, and two. Two has literally just started seven seconds ago. So if we go into the first one, hopefully we should see Where's it gone? Service equals three. So we've added the new node. But what we should see so here we see how we have our baseline with the two nodes, and we've got a third node that the cluster doesn't really know about and is not really trusting. I don't want to use this right now. So um, it might use it for things like compute, but it's not going to store data there because it doesn't know how long that's, that node is going to be around. So what we can do, we can add the node to the cluster. There you see, now we have three nodes in the cluster. And you can kind of do the same thing, um, scaling back. So you, kind of, you, um, you can do the scale down, go back to two nodes. And because we have the, back, the backups equals two, um, when we take down a node, the data's still going to be there. And we can kind of take that node out of commission. So I realize I'm running a bit over, so I'm going to leave that for now. But you should get the idea. It's kind of pretty straightforward. And that's kind of it. Um, so I know that's kind of a quick tour through uh, how, you, how you run it. But basically, the, the tricks are uh, this Kubernetes IP finder, so all the nodes can find each other. Um, and stateful sets is the uh, other one that you might not be familiar with. It's a relatively new Kubernetes feature, but it's kind of critical in making something like this work. You probably could fake it a bit using rec replica sets, but it's a bit harder to kind of manage because you don't know which, which nodes are going to come and go. It's effectively kind of random. If you want to find more information about Ignite, uh, ignite.apache.org is the obvious place. Um, that's the kind of center. Um, there are a bunch of readme's uh, documentation on the uh, patchignite.readme.io uh, site, um, the full set documentation, including the Kubernetes deployment instructions. Um, and if you're really looking to dig down into the details, all source code is on uh, GitHub. And the interesting place for the uh, Kubernetes bit is in the modules Kubernetes uh, uh, directory. Um, I got a bunch of information from this Kubernetes up and running book, which is very helpful. Um, and yeah, I, I work for Gridgain. Uh, Gridgain is the company that basically supports uh, Ignite commercial versions of it. So uh, everything I've talked about today is in the open source version. You get it all there. But if you play around with it and need kind of professional support, uh, where the people to talk to. Uh, so that's me, unless anyone has any questions. Well, I'll be around for most of the rest of the day. Um, say hello if you see me. Um, other than that, thanks. Thank you very much for your time. Um, hope you found this useful.